Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to another of our series of broadcasts from tomorrow. Today, uh, we're really excited to share with you two months of work and research, uh, our new report in permaculture, which is an exploration around um, youth and the future of living. And this is in collaboration uh, with the amazing design and research lab Space 10, who are based in Copenhagen. And um, so today I'm going to take you through just some key findings. After this, we're going to be actually launching the full report, um, which is free to download and will direct you to the right links. Um, and you can also have a recording of this uh, webinar. So I'm going to take you through some key findings and then we're going to have a discussion uh, with our panelists. If you have any questions throughout this, please use the Q&A box. Um, at the side, and I'll try my best to, to get to as many questions as I can. But yeah, so firstly, just a quick note on methodology. So as I said, this is a really big piece of work. A lot of research has gone into this. We've done a huge survey uh, across the world with 18 to 24 year olds. We've spoken to six experts, again, global experts. And then we've also done in-depth interviews and, and kind of followed um, the behaviours of six Gen Zers uh, across the globe. And here's a, a quick snapshot of who we spoke to. Before I kind of get into some of the key findings, I just want to give a bit of context to the audience, just so I can paint a bit of a picture for you. So they spend most time at university, online, in their shared house or in their parents' homes. They live with parents or relatives, with friends, in student accommodation or people they don't know. They spend the most time um, when it comes to devices not surprisingly on the smartphone, also computer, watching television. And then since the pandemic, uh, they spend more time at home. Home is more important to them and it's also more multifunctional. And when it comes to kind of top concerns, I think this just gives a, a good idea of kind of their headspace. Um, climate crisis came out on top, financial security uh, closely follows, and then achieving personal goals. And when it comes to priorities, they're really prioritizing close relationships, creative interests, and their mental health. So looking at this research and kind of where we started, we really wanted to unpack what home means to young people um, as a concept and try and think really broad about it, um, not just as the physical space, but what does this mean to young people? Um, and as Helen rightly says, you know, we're at the beginning of a very transformative decade, uh, one where for many the home will be the most important place in the world. I think when we often think of home, we do think of the physical space, but actually it has such resonance. This piece of research has really shown that with the next generation, it's much bigger than that. Um, and also, you know, we're at a really kind of a time where home is very prevalent and um, there's a huge amount of people living in slums or informal settlements and the numbers are really crazy and so in this time where also home seems more difficult to attain uh, it is it's important that we create a sense of home in other ways. I just want to share quickly um, this video from some of the respondents that we spoke to and we just asked them kind of what home means to them, it just gives you a bit of a flavour. Hi, I'm Hart. Hi, my name is Mama. My name is Christopher. Hi, I'm Tiara Matusen. I live here in London. I live with my boyfriends in Paris. I live in Alberta, Canada. I live in Mexico with mis padres y uno de mis hermanos. I live in East London with three housemates. Home is just a place where I feel the most comfortable, where I can be myself, be creative, where I can just relax. Everyone has their own definition of what home means to them, and no one person will be the same. Es el lugar en donde te sientes a home is a comfort zone. It's a safe haven. Everybody's emotionally connected. I also feel at home in the dance studio, on stage. I feel definitely more at home when I'm not the only POC in a room. Also my online presence, I feel at home. I am fascinated with collection. All the little like decorations and knickknacks. A dream of mine is have a heart-shaped bathtub and a home movie cinema. So in permaculture, 
the name of the report, what does it mean um, and how did we kind of get to this? Um, we are in this moment of instability, an era of instability. There are seismic kind of political cultural shifts that are really fundamentally changing the next generation's relationship with home. And um, there are many factors that are influencing this kind of instability. And out of this, there's a huge mental health crisis currently, particularly uh, affecting 18 to 24 year olds. Um, you know, there's a huge displacement when it comes to home. 281 million people are currently displaced. There's climate collapse. There are growing divides and we're in the midst of a peak trust crisis. So in many ways, this is really influencing why home is extremely important to the next generation and why it also goes beyond the physical. Um, and this is really what in permaculture represents this kind of tension between the transient, uh, the temporary isolation connection, um, the kind of feeling of being uprooted, displacement, having to live in this state of impermanence. And it is important to note that, you know, young people are being robbed of this kind of human fundamental right to actually put down roots and in many ways attain and, and own land. Um, the next generation are more connected uh, than ever, but they're also the loneliest they've ever been. And this is really quite unsustainable and something we need to address as a society and a culture. And this is in permaculture. One of the key, um, I guess, key uh, ideas of home is safety and comfort has come from, from this bit of research. And I, I think in many ways it's unsurprising, but it's really important to the next generation. Um, this idea of having that stability, which in, in part must be a reflection of the era of instability and everything that is going on in the world. So what is home now? Um, just to give you some of the key findings from the survey, um, you know, as I said, home isn't just a place, it can be people, the friends, family, communities that nurture and sustain you. It can be a state of being, a feeling of safety, the sense of fitting just right, of complete belonging. And we've really seen that home in a way has become much more closely tied to self, and um, but also the kind of the, the people and, and objects around you that are in close proximity to you. So it's it's a feeling. It's um, that's come out that it's it's more of a feeling than a physical space, um, but it's also about um, this feeling of freedom, being able to express yourself, and that also links to the idea of safety, feeling like safe enough to be whoever you want to be and who you are. The top priorities when it came to home were comfort, safety, self-expression, love, peace, human connection. And expectations when it comes to home is there's a desire for more space, safety, home ownership, natural light, a space to explore interests and hobbies and a space to escape. But on the flip side to that, you know, there's a lot of these things are quite unattainable or unrealistic in the kind of current circumstances. Home is more than the space and there are so much positive sentiment that's come out of this. Um, you know, home is where the heart is, was referenced a lot. Um, yes, it can be this space or a sense of feeling satisfied, but it can also be a place where my bed is and my things are. Um, you know, there was yeah lots of sensory words used by the audience. It's warmness, like a hug. Um, and a real like, yeah, a very kind of developed um, and mature understanding, you know, home is a construct that we impose on the space that makes us most comfortable. Um, some amazing, amazing quotes, too many <laughs> to put in, but there's a lot more in the in the full report. So what are Gen Z's new rules for living? There's kind of five key chapters um, around these new definitions um, of home and kind of how that's shifted. So firstly, identity, I've touched on this, but home becoming closely um, kind of connected to self uh, and identity uh, has really come out. You know, Gen Z, 15% of Gen Z associate home with a sense of self. 
13 um, set of physical space, so it's more than the physical space. Uh, and with that comes objects as mobile homes. So when home ownership becomes less attainable, the objects that we have within our spaces are much more representation uh, of home, this kind of uh, desire to have physical items that have real, real meaning to us. And we've seen, could be a reflection, the increase in searches for maximalist interior design, um, but also the, yeah, the resonance of objects connecting you to perhaps a place that you were displaced from. And also the need for spaces of representation. Julian Knox, the artist that we spoke to said, you know, the objects that, um, and spaces that he finds himself in are not always designed by someone like you. You'd, often he feels like he's living in someone else's dream. And there is a huge lack of representation and diversity within the interior design space um, and the architecture space. And this is something that needs to kind of be spoken about more. The, the facts are actually really, really um, depressing. Community is our next chapter and just the, the fact that community is this, again, a huge important to the next generation and a reflection of home. Um, you know, many people have been displaced and this means that we are transferring home to the people around us and this uh, need for kind of connection and an exchange of intergenerational knowledge. And um, the future is also shared, you know, more and more of us will be living in shared homes um, or living with parents for longer amounts of times um, and the future will see this continue. Um, in, in the survey that we did, 35% of Gen Z said that they would like to cohabit with friends um, and also random people. It seems like this is much more the norm. Um, and we've also seen on social media the kind of trend or people joking around wanting to be in a couple as a way to reduce rent, but I think is a very real, um, a very real trend and, and fact. And then we're seeing this move to kind of local and IRL, uh, maybe in part um, kind of influenced by the fact that we spend so much time online, the next generation do, um, and social media, and 79% of Gen Z feel alone. So this need to connect in real life and have a connection to the local community, um, we're going to see much more of. Spaces themselves are still really important, and you know many people do associate physical space with home. However, they are uh, changing or our relationship with them is changing. So I found surprising that the majority of 18 to 24 year olds really do want to own a home, um, but 40% believe it's unrealistic. And I think what's interesting here as well is that um, men think it's most realistic and women in non-binary um, feel like it's least uh, realistic. Um, perhaps that's unsurprising. Um, and 43% of Gen Z, I yeah, see their living situation is short term. It's quite expected now to be living in this transient state. The bedroom is really important and in many ways is, uh, is people's homes and um, the smaller spaces and they're the only kind of personal private space if you're in a shared house or your parents' house um, and house, houses are shrinking. And more and more people are spending more time at home since the pandemic. So it's a real question there around how that's affecting our mental health. And then home away from home is maybe a counter movement to that we are transferring home into other spaces, um, our workspaces, our offices, or one in kind of separate studio spaces um, as a way to kind of have uh, have a have a change of scene and a, and a respite from this kind of claustrophobic environment and um, only 15 percent of 18 to 24 year olds want to socialize or do socialize in their homes and then another respondent said you know home is actually wherever I am and um, whether that's talking to my friends online or offline it's much more closely kind of connected to self rather than place and yeah, bedroom in a way has become a space of production and reproduction. You know, it's everything. It's studio, place of play, rest, sanctuary, workspace. We're asking a lot of our bedrooms. Um, and this also kind of links quite um, nicely to this idea, I guess, around mental health and the need for safe and, um, you know, health positive spaces. So 
as I mentioned, yeah, safety is a huge, huge theme and um, needing these homes being a sanctuary for safety um, and wellness as well. You know, when we asked about the most important features of their ideal home, the top response was about natural light, which um, I think says a lot maybe about current people's living conditions. And um, they also chose a large space and, pick, and, and a garden. We need, yeah, this sense of kind of wellness and caring for yourself and your space. Alongside that, the climate uh, crisis can, cannot be ignored. You know, climate health, um, most waste in our environment is actually from our homes and, and it's a huge priority for, for Gen Z. So we need to be thinking about this when it comes to how we're living, but also how we construct homes. Um, and finally, connected homes. Um, so, you know, technology is completely transforming the way that we live. Um, the internet, you know, it's a necessity. It's not a luxury, even though not the whole world has it. Um, it is becoming home. In many ways, it is our home. We're online right now. And with that comes kind of a new anxiety around surveillance. Um, you know, data is flowing in and out of our homes. Uh, it's tracking our sleep patterns. Um, three quarters of teenagers today believe voice assistants listen to what they say. I definitely think that they do. Um, and the smart home market is predicted to grow. So this is going to be an increasing kind of concern or issue that um, brands and tech needs to really think about. And we know that privacy um, is really prioritized by the next generation. We had many responses saying privacy is beautiful and it's really connected to, to home and important to home. And um, so, yeah, we I think this also perhaps is the fact that, you know, we've been in the pandemic, we're on Zoom right now, we've exposed our lives, our homes. Um, it's kind of put a lot of pressure around how we express ourselves in our homes as well, but also social media, you know, we're seeing 34% of young people disconnecting from social media and this, this need or favor for in real life connection. Um, and yeah, you know, social media is also leading to kind of mental health, really negative mental health um, effects and a lot of young people feeling left out. Um, and then I guess on the flip side to that, which we'll talk a bit more about in the discussion, but the blurred boundaries of online and offline and, the ever um, the ever increasing metaverse that is upon us. You know, the internet is redefining how we communicate, how we connect, experiences. Um, and Ash Kusha, who's CEO of Orbit, who are a metaverse um, company, he believes that smart TVs are going to be the metaverse device within the home, and they're going to be a way of us connecting more so than the smartphone. So what does the future hold for home? This is just a bit of a snapshot of some predictions around where home goes in the future. Um, that home will become a space for creative self-exploration. There's gonna be more kind of multifunctional spaces, but they are gonna to need to allow for creativity and exploration of self. And um, we're also going to see kind of more spaces designed for that shared living. So this concept of the nuclear family, which a lot of our homes are kind of uh, built and, and designed around, will completely change. You know, maybe we'll see more shared living. We're already seeing shared living, but where, you know, there's shared kitchens or spaces you could rent out, like dining room spaces, um, but that are like sole spaces are smaller. Homes will become smaller, modular and portable. Cornwall is currently planning to build these kind of 15 tester houses to tackle um, housing crisis. Um, but there's a lot of interesting projects going on. Um, I think, it, yeah, thinking about space and then how, where we go outside of our smaller spaces in order to have that freedom and connection uh, and maybe the natural light and space that we need as human beings. And then climate change, of course, will alter um, the shape of the home. And there's yeah, incredible innovation happening, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And um, this is just an example um, of an architecture studio in Bologna, and they use kind of 3D printed locally sourced clay uh, and can build these like prototype homes in eight days. I think there's also a shift and a look towards indigenous uh, techniques um, in terms of innovating uh, in, in terms of building materials and how we shape the future of home. 
And then tech, as, as I mentioned with smart homes, you know, this is the future and it will make home and communities healthier and more efficient. There's a real focus around health. Um, nearly 4 million people die prematurely from illness attribution to household air pollution, which is a huge number, um, it's quite scary. And then finally, the metaverse um, will become home um, for many of us. Uh, we're already seeing, you know, the smartphone is classed as home, a place where we live, uh, and we're going to be spending more and more time in the metaverse. Seoul has announced, one of the first cities to announce that they're going to kind of uh, imagine themselves fully virtual. This is already happening. Um, it's exciting, but there's a lot to kind of um, really think about in the process of this. So just as a quick summary and snapshot from some of the findings in the research, home is described as a feeling more than a physical space. It's extremely important to Gen Z and really closely tied to identity. Home ownership is really desired, but it's not seen as realistic. Home is very transient and temporary. It's about comfort and safety. They're really the most important things, but a lot of also positive um, attributions like love, peace. Uh, and then Gen Z's relationship with their communities are a real, a top priority. So now I'm going to open up um, the floor to our amazing panelists, and we're just going to kind of discuss some of the key findings um, and areas that we've kind of touched on. So thank you all so much for joining. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, but I'll quickly introduce you all. So Helen Job um, is the Insights Director at Space 10, who we've been working closely. Damara Ingles, um, based in Portugal, is Metaverse designer and strategist. And Jenna Fletcher is design consultant and founder of the interiors <coughs> brand Oswald. Thank you all for joining um, me today. I'm just gonna stop sharing. I hope that this will work. <laughs> all good um yeah thanks it's really really great to have you and i guess i kind of wanted to start the discussion off with something helen that i've put within this um presentation around home being or becoming the most important thing or more important and kind of unpacking that a little bit more because i think It'd be great to get your perspective on why you think home is becoming more important to the next generation. Yeah, I mean, obviously, home is something that we spend an awful lot of time thinking about at Space 10. And what was really exciting about this report is it really confirmed a lot of the hypotheses, hypotheses that we've um, been playing around with. And actually, your intro of your highlights was bang on with what we've been thinking about. I think if we first think about home in terms of the physical home, and then we can think about it in terms of emotional homes, but the physical home has become so much more than it had to be, right? So you, you touched upon this, you know, the physical home used to be about it being a shelter, but it's had to become so much more flexible. You know, it's our workplace, it's our gym, it's where we get into retail experience, it's our entertainment space, it's our wellness center. So there's this need for flexibility in the physical home that has developed like since the pandemic, but also it was developing anyway because of tech. It's just the pandemic sped all of these sort of tech developments up. But I mean, I think much more interesting and important than that is this idea of the emotional homes and that we need to redefine the concept of home. Just thinking about this four walls or this box of objects seems really re reductive um, for what the needs are going forward. You know, human needs are for shelter and belonging and freedom of identity and all of that. And for a lot of people, they're not able to find that in a physical home or not able to find that within their family of origin. So home becomes about the community it also becomes about our shared home which is obviously the planet and our connection with that and I think particularly for young people it's like they're having to have a, a different relationship with progress and success so you know this idea that owning a home became a marker of success you know you, you leave home you get, have, get your first job you have a baby you get married you get a home that isn't achievable for many people but also it's not desirable for a lot of people too so I think Home becomes about where you can feel present, where you can feel that you're on some kind of forward trajectory, but not in this sort of traditional sense. And so, you know, this idea of like post-family setups or living in this co-living or living in these new communities, 
I mean, to be honest, the LGBTQIA community have been doing this for years, you know, understanding the need for a chosen family. And I think, so the home, the physical home needs to become more flexible, but the idea of community and home also needs to be very sort of movable and flexible in that sense. So we're going to see the homes themselves like that. We're also going to see household compositions being very difficult, uh, very different and people finding finding solace in a physical space or a digital space or a community much more than perhaps um, in the home that they grew up in. And obviously, you know, there's many people that don't even have the luxury of, of having a home, which we, we can talk about a little bit later as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. It just, show, it just it, I guess, yeah, highlights how home means so much more now and it's so why is important and that there was something Kwame one of the experts said which which did resonate with me around though that like human fundamental right of being able to like own something like invest that is kind of being robbed for the next generation but I think they are you know you it means that home is broadening and we're putting or they are putting meaning or connection into lots of other things or a sense of security but I do how do you feel about that do you think that that is just a part of the future in terms of you know the the ability to own and and that's not going to change or do you see you know governments and societies supporting young people in that and that's a big question but I just I found it really interesting it depends if I'm in a negative or positive <laughs> mindset to be honest I mean I, I have to I have to believe in a positive future otherwise I couldn't do what I do for a living but um I think <sighs> I think there is a changing relationship with ownership in this um, generation that they don't expect it. They uh, and therefore are being quite creative in approaches to it. You know, there's some great data from the US about the names, the, the surnames on mortgage applications. You know, you get four or five different surnames on a mortgage application because people are finding ways to come together and own in that sense. You know, I fully believe that if you know governments communities individuals uh, research departments we all work together we could make some great change but i'm not massively optimistic that that's going to happen that's a good answer i think i would agree with you but you touched on um one of the themes in the report that came out is that this sense of community uh, being really important and closely tied to home particularly if you have been displaced, um, but I think more so for the next generation. And I wondered, Damara, if you could kind of share any, any thoughts around how you think communities are shaping our idea of home or, you know, are there any interesting communities you know of that, that are doing interesting things to support people? Um, or yeah, just any, any thoughts from you would be great around community. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think that the reality that so many people are being displaced um, is becoming more and more urgent uh, because of climate change, because of war, for example, because of refugee crisis. But I think that more and more because of human development, uh, development and how human in, humans interact with each other as well. So we look, see a lot of political instability, um, a lot of fearful that, you know, we've been on a process in the last decades so that people are able to find their own sense of, it, of individuality, their own personal truths. And now we see this sort of cultural and political shift where our personal truths are denied and sort of trying to be taken away from us. So it's more and more important um, that people find safe spaces and safe communities that they are able to call home. Specifically talking about um, the metaverse, I think that the sense of community is the most important. Because when we talk about the metaverse, we are talking about the extension of interhuman connections. We are talking about an uh, abstract uh, and immersive, uh, you know, hangout room, basically, where instead of being four or six people, we have millions of people there at the same um, uh, interacting uh, at the same time. So it's important that there, there is space to create a sense of identity, but it's also imp important that there is space to create a sense of collectiveness. As more and more our physical spaces become sort of 
distance, distant from our notions of selves and our notion of purpose, it is important to find that notion in other places. Some of the communities that I really, really love to connect with online, for example, is the DG Girl Collective. There is basically um, a collective of over 200 um, 3D and digital designers. It's focused on the femme and non-binary identity. So it means that we have this massive collective brain of uh, creatives that think and theorize the future of the metaverse and the future of community spaces um, together. Other amazing spaces for this are actually in real life physical spaces. So here in Lisbon now we have this collective, there is the Dango Club, and it's a Latinx and Afro a queer focused club. Uh, and more than just a place to go and dance, you know, it's a place to meet people that come from the same walk of life as you. It's a place to connect with artists that come from the same place as you. It's a place to talk about uh, subjects that might be taboo to speak outside of that specific uh, space. So at the same time, the notion of home is becoming more um, instable, instable in the physical sense, but also there is a need and the construction of safe physical places where people can come together and really develop um, a sense of community, especially in times where we see so many um, people travel across the world just to find their truths uh, being justified, right? And if my body is alienated in my home country and I move somewhere else to find safety and then due to the political instability in that place, that place also becomes unsafe to me, then I don't have anywhere else to go. I have to stand my ground and uh, my community has to stand up in a way that affects the real world and the way that we dream about the real world as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, what you're saying about kind of real life versus online is interesting as well because I think there is so much discussion about the metaverse, but also when you look at the facts and how much time we do spend online already, but then also a sort of backlash to that and a need coming out of the pandemic as well, like physical connection is so important. And I just wonder how you see that evolving in time, like what is the metaverse's role um, in the future of home or how do you see that relationship between online and offline? evolving oh my god i think that the future is hybrid the future is a hundred percent hybrid i think that every reality that we are able to bring to create we will become more and more aware that our own notion of being human is hybrid you know the brain is like a snail it just needs a shell to hide, to hide under anywhere is home any place and any sensation can be um consider home and I think that we'll see the metaverse becoming more and more of that shell that the snail carries right so as an emigrant I come from an emigrant family we moved to Portugal um, the only way that we had to keep connection with our family in Angola was through our devices through our mobile devices was the only absolute way that we could um stay in touch with each other so technology is already fundamental for us to be able to carry emotional connections to be able to carry our emotional luggage and baggage with us um, everywhere we go and i think that we'll be seeing more and more of that hybrid reality we'll see more of utilizing the metaverse to sort of enhance and exalt in real life uh, interaction and we also see more of real life interaction that can be um, taken to different levels uh, through the metaverse my critical point in relation to seeing the metaverse as home is that again, home is a collective concept, is a place that we inhabit together, like the metaverse, is the notion that first of all, many people don't have access to the internet or to electricity in that sense. So for us to call the metaverse, you know, the new home of humanity, we're leaving a lot of people behind. Mm -hmm. um, also the notion of safety, right? If, the notion of safety is so important in a mobile home 
being it, you know, a set of objects that I carry or this phone where I carry all of my family and all of my social family in that sense. Um, then how can I be safe in those spaces? Because now I don't have a physical architecture structure that protects me. Now there is a pressure in myself that my body will protect me, that I will be hyper alert, that I will be aware of uh, my surroundings as well. And for me, these are the biggest thinking points. How can the metaverse be safer? How can people feel comfortable within the metaverse? How can people be accountable within the metaverse? So if you abuse me, how can I, through your username, be able to you know, hold you accountable? But above it all, how can I interact socially and keep my anonymity? Because home is a place where we want to be seen, where we want to be heard, where we want to connect. But home is also a place where we want to be unseen when we want to be silent and we want to be disconnected. So how can we merge these very contrasting and extreme notions of home inside you know, uh, the framework of what the metaverse is? Yeah, I mean, I think you've raised a lot of really interesting points there just around yeah, blurring boundaries and the need for safe spaces online. It is a very kind of wild west, it seems at the moment. And, we talk about it a lot, but I'm quite cynical about these big tech companies building these metaverse spaces. But I think, yeah, and, and I guess one of the findings from the report, I think it was Jack Self who said, you know, about the growing divides around the world. And he sees that the kind of trends uh, in terms of like interior design and the connection to kind of local aesthetics and kind of craftsmanship is going to really influence our own interior design at a more kind of object level, um, which I found quite an interesting concept as a sort of backlash to globalization and kind of us all adopting the same trends. I mean, not all of us, but you know, these mass trends um, going around the world. And I guess relating that um, or thinking about that in terms of interior design, I wondered, Jenna, if you had any thoughts, you know, you've got, um, a great brand that is about kind of, you know, reusing um, and kind of curating these amazing interior pieces. But what's your thoughts on interior design at the moment um, or any trends that you're seeing uh, emerge um, and how that plays into kind of a broader conversation? So I think we've seen recently, I think in the last couple of years, everyone kind of not only spend more time in their homes and sort of recalibrate the way they feel about the objects that surround them, but also how they source those things and how we bring those things into our home. And we're sort of sitting in a world where we have to think about the S word of sustainability and how we physically manifest objects into our lives. And, you know, going to big warehouses and picking up flat pack furniture isn't everybody's knee jerk kind of reactive way to um, have objects in their house. And I think that we live in a world now where we're so interconnected and we have everything at our fingertips. And the pandemic also accelerated our kind of, our ability to have these things in an instant, which, me which meant that like people like me, exist in a way that you can go on Instagram and buy a whole house's worth of furniture within a day and have it immediately. There's, there's so much availability. Um, and so I think that in terms of trends for interior design, I think that people are very aware of like now so more than ever, um, amazing design being so permanent and so long lasting. And I think that we again have been really lucky to live in a world where we can have everything flat packed to our house immediately but also have access to incredible design have it at our fingertips be able to have it for generations to come and I think that's really quite poignant as well as like thinking about investing in pieces and thinking about like my kids having these pieces and my friends and passing it around friendship groups and like inheriting houses because we're all moving around so much within communities where like passing houses because of socioeconomic kind of constraints as well we're saying okay it's I've got this house you keep this house we're gonna we're gonna pass our furniture around as well it's like a very interesting kind of way of having home equipment and home objects 
in our lives. Yeah, I I found that interesting in terms of, I guess, um, I think it was Michelle, one of the experts who um, is a lecturer, and she was saying that objects she believes are becoming more important to us as these like physical manifestations of like memory and stability and because they're things you can carry with you but at the same time we have less space and there's less space for objects and there is I feel personally this tension I feel almost guilty that I put a lot of emotion into stuff and I'm like I'm not going to be able to carry it all with me forever so I have to be more careful or like be able to let things go um I don't know I feel this tension though of like stuff is really important but then we kind of need less stuff so maybe we need to be more savvy or think about how we can pass it on and that's very personal to me, but I um, mm-hmm. I feel that it's it's something that's a tension that exists in the way we live and the next generation are gonna live. Yeah, I think yeah, I think there's like you know you've got the extreme of like clutter core, and then you've got the you've got the other side which is you know extreme minimalism and carrying choosing not to carry so much around with you in the world, but also that sense of impermanence and transience and flux, like having, you know, having your room be your world and your home and like where you feel safest and where you inhabit the most time, you know, and so having your objects and having loads of objects or having zero objects in there, but those objects being of extreme importance and connection to your person and them representing everything you kind of, you exist as on this planet, you know, (laughs) is I think, really quite poignant yeah I mean I think uh I totally agree with what you're saying Jenna it's like also if we're looking at this like mass migration that's happening and people yeah. being displaced it's like you've got to find uh ways to like have a sense of home to attain a sense of home and I think one of the ways you can do that is through objects but one of you know but you can also do it through memories or rituals and I think we're seeing a lot more of that and also people looking into their ancestry and their you know the heritage and their past to find some kind of sense of connection if you can't find that in a physical location or a physical space that you're in yeah that's yeah. that's so true and actually relates as to one of the questions from the audience a little bit um who's saying you know there's this big issue with relocation and displacement especially youth from ukraine and other countries and this issue will only continue to grow so um you know how do you keep this feeling of home in such circumstances which i guess helen you've sort of partly answered with um yeah yeah i mean it's really difficult and i was looking at the stats in the report i think it's like almost half of refugees worldwide are going to be under the age of 18 you know and we've already got like a billion i think is it a billion people living in in informal settlements which by 2030 is like something like 3 billion and it's you know we can we can pretend that by using recycled materials and looking at waste we can we can solve the the climate crisis in building but we can't we're going to have all of these people with nowhere to live and really difficult situations to live in so i think looking into like how to pe- make people feel at home is definitely something that we're thinking about a lot of space 10 at the moment is like how how can you create a sense of home if you don't have one so it's yeah it's there's no easy solution to it but it's something that definitely needs a lot of thought and attention yeah what an amazing like question or challenge to have to think about um but I do think it's such a rich territory and it's I feel there is a need to like when you think or hear the word home it it doesn't really mean we've we've come so far from what it still means to so many people um so I hope yeah this discussion kind of does provoke or challenge people's expectations and it just brings up so many uh, I guess issues and, and challenges for the next generation um, someone has asked Celine has asked how do you think perhaps Jenna this is a question for you how do you think the shift in what home is will shift the landscape of retail that's a really interesting question um, I think that um the shift in what home is is so hard to put a finger on and I think for in terms of in terms of retail we've seen it happen we've seen it happen with the emergence of people like me who are on Instagram selling product 
um, to their immediate circle in a very like localized way, in a very like, you know, um, trend driven, reactive way of noticing kind of like what people really needed. My whole thing with Oswald was kind of realizing that my immediate circle and my friends were needing to buy small objects that were foldable, movable. Um, we were all living in like rented accommodation and so that we can commit to buying the like huge coffee table. So we'd, uh, the huge dining table. So we'd buy like some chic foldable chairs instead. And so I think retail looking towards like, even the conceptually like looking towards like homewares as being a thing that young people invest in or even interested in. I, I just think we're in a new world where people were like, everyone's kind of like logged on to the interiors kind of conversation and everyone's kind of checked in and we all live in houses. We all have a bedroom. We all live, we all go to an office. We all like inhabit space and being a bit more kind of like checked into the fact that that space is, is where we exist in the world increasingly so with the pandemic we all spent two years at home um but I think with with retail it's just an interesting kind of in terms of interiors we've had this very like um I think like stagnant kind of way of presenting home equipment to people and I think that um companies now are kind of like pivoting and, and, and exchanging kind of ideas on how to kind of reframe how we buy stuff and how we even go about finding stuff no you know? yeah totally I mean I think what you're doing is really great and I wonder if we will I hope we will see I think within like the fashion space there is a lot more conversation around like reusing recycling and that's a journey that's going to take time but I guess fashion's the biggest, one of the biggest pollute, polluters, but um, when it comes to home, we're just like the pandemic influencing, you know, the fast homeware movement and it just like shifting to home so quickly. And that's still very much a thing like disposable homeware items are so cheap. And yeah. I really hope brands are, I mean, I know Ikea are also kind of, they've got like a reuse section. And I think your point about design, you know, like the fact that they worked with amazing designers and that those those objects hold real value and can be, you know, reused is amazing. I, yeah, I hope brands can kind of adopt to more, you know, do we need to make more stuff? Um, yeah. So the, the thought around, you know, we do need more homes, but also like, it's so we really need to think carefully about how we're constructing these homes and can we use recycled materials and I mean it's a whole area that I'm not an expert in but it's feels like um there's innovation happening but there's just so much more that we need to to do it's so overwhelming um anyway I'm going off on a rant but um I'll get to there's a couple more questions that I think are quite interesting um Tara um has said for, De, for Damara thinking she's thinking about um, music and is there a link between music and home and how will this impact um, how, how what Damara was talking about with the metaverse maybe there's something kind of around like the sensory and music being like a, a sort of connection to community and shared experience I don't know Damara what are your thoughts around that Oh my God, yes, definitely. I mean, coming from an African Angolan family, when we moved to Portugal, there were like a set of objects that we really had to bring with us. And it was like the records that my parents had and the CDs. It was um, this article that allows you to make the fufu, you know, the traditional African food and something also to grind vegetables and other things. So these very three objects, you know, cooking and music are like the biggest part of uh, Angolan culture at least. And so the biggest part of my own notion of home. Everywhere I go, I have a record player, I have a hundred records and I have a Spotify account and I have uh, 1000 songs on a playlist. So definitely music is crucial. And the, how, the notion of home is very sensorial as well, right? Home is, that's why it's a feeling. That's why it's able to become an abstract notion, an abstract concept and not just a physical space because it's so sensorial. It's the, the smell of the traditional food that your mama cooks every Saturday and maybe 
decades af after you find that same sensation in a friend's backyard when you're sharing a recipe with them, for example, or um, the sound of spaces, the sound of music in my house, we always had uh, music playing, specific music more for my parents' uh, generation. So definitely taking all of these emotional items of connection and of sensation into the metaverse is crucial. Otherwise, people will not feel at home in metaverse spaces. They'll, say, so they'll only feel that they are, you know, inside, a, let's say, a constructed space. So a big challenge of the metaverse and of metaverse design right now is how can we bring more senses um, into connection? How can we add uh, more sensations, how can we replicate, you know, the, that smell of uh, homemade cookies or that sensation of sitting in a genuine leather comfy sofa that always makes that weird squeaky sound. These are the things that make us feel like we are in a place that we belong. And these are the things that have to be included. I would say that more than just music, because there are many ways of including MP3 in uh, metaverse spaces, for example, I would focus more on these everyday ritual sounds that are part of how we engage with the world, right? So if I'm in my metaverse home, maybe the sound of birds, uh, if I'm there in, you know, at night and it's dusk, maybe the sound of birds will create that idea that, okay, even if I'm in the metaverse, you know, that sensation that I'm associated to a space, that there is a timeline associated to a space, that there is the sound of cars maybe passing by or maybe not. But I think it's important for people to define what sounds like home for them. And it's also important for designers to start approaching these concepts from a meta-human centric perspective, right? Not so much from the perspective of uh, what is a priority to me in my culture as a designer to have a share versus what is a share in the metaverse if no one is sitting in it and how many cultures exist without chairs. So I think these are like the points of questions that we have to start um, answering. Amazing, thanks Tamara. I wonder if to, to kind of end the discussion on if you could all maybe share either something you want people to kind of remember around home or a future prediction, because I think it's, it is such a rich territory, but it'd be great and you've all got such different perspectives. Um, yeah, a kind of a key takeaway or a prediction would be great. I wonder Helen, if you would like to go first. Oh, I knew you were going to come to me. <laughs> um, I think uh, what's been really fascinating through this piece of research is the the out of all of these things, it's the need for connection and the need to feel like that you are able to be your true self and you're able to connect with people. And I think the other sort of overarching concern that people have is about, you know, the planet's on fire. You know, we've got so... I guess what I would like to see or work towards is how we can see technology as a facilitator, facilitator of positive change in all of these spaces. So it's like, how can we use tech to improve air quality? How can we use it to look at healthier living? How can we use it to stop people feeling lonely? Like I'm all in favor of like, you know, um, the, the metaverse and everything like that, if we can somehow make it an inclusive, accessible space that people feel at home, but also it's moving to solve some of the issues that we've got. Because the issues of like, of needing a home and needing belonging and shelter and all of that, they've existed forever, but we've got these new sort of crises upon us, the cost of living and the climate crises, and we need ways to solve it. And the only way we're gonna do that is through collaboration. And the only way we're gonna be able to collaborate at scale is by using technology so my wish would be that we we use the metaverse uh, and well and web3 in general as a positive way to move forward great answer helen jenna what's your thoughts i think with that said as well i'm one of the things that was said just now was about how the metaverse is kind of running off in that direction and we are leaving a whole kind of like world of people behind and that having that balance and you know leaning into that what the metaverse can do for us but also acknowledging kind of 
the people that are left behind and the people that can't don't have that kind of framework or infrastructure to kind of use to their ability to you know own a house or have a nice a nice house or even whatever that means and I think Jack self touches on it a lot with his kind of um worth looking into his real real homes kind of concept which is an incredible um and really reformative concept of real estate where the home home ownership revolution that's going to happen there's a huge like transfer of wealth happening between like our parents and us and and also gen z and like how that will look and that plays into kind of having multiple surnames on a mortgage and 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 how that will kind of uh work work into our futures of what our homes look like so i think my takeaway is kind of like thinking about the universe universality of like homes and how our techno yeah our technology will help us kind of like change the way we live but also acknowledging the fact that we have to kind of reform and improve the way and the, and the processes and the infrastructure that we do already have and make it better for everyone somehow definitely <laughs> hopefully <laughs> and last but definitely not least Damara what are your um thoughts you want to leave with and with ah, my thoughts are the metaverse will never replace reality and the meta home will never replace the home it can only be an extension and the, the only way that it can be an extension is if more and more of us feel that we are part and comfortable within it i love that quote from the report that says that you know as a black person uh, i basically live in spaces dreamed and imagined by someone else right um, as an African person, I'm happy to have this connection with my heritage and to see, you know, furniture pieces that are designed for my culture and for the usefulness of my culture. So is that um, inclusion for me? But above it all, I think that the notion of permanence is not very sustainable. And the main reason why we're having all of this housing crisis is because we've been insisting in contradicting nature, you know, and the reality that most things in nature are cyclical, cyclical you know, oranges don't grow throughout the entire year in the same place. They depend on the weather. Um, swallows in Portugal, we have the Andorinhas, we, they are the, our one of our national symbols. They travel across the world to follow summers. So us humans have been nomadic for a long time, for more time that we've been static. Mm -hmm. So I think that this crisis only shows that we need to have this ability to move and to work in the process of nature. We need to adapt to nature and not to the housing crisis per se. And I think that what Jenna says, it's absolutely amazing, is this idea of heritage, of passing, um, a piece of furniture for me to my great granddaughter that might not be this super fancy vanity uh, mirror or something like that because I don't have space to carry it. Maybe it's the artifact of a plastic bottle that I put some flowers in it and I use it as a vessel, as a container and I'm able to carry it throughout generations. So I think that in many ways, this housing crisis or this idea that we're being displaced might actually bring us back to a place where we are able to create long-term solutions for human issues. Wow, what a great way to kind of end. <laughs> I just, yeah, I wanna say thanks. It's so great to have such uh, amazing people on the panel and just to get to kind of unpick um, your brains a little bit more and hear um, your perspective, because it's really inspiring. And yeah, I hope it's been, really interesting for everyone watching. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be sharing the report with everyone after this, and there will be a recording available to download as well. Um, thanks so much for joining and keep your eyes peeled for, for our next in the series. But yeah, thank you all for joining and being a part of this. And we'll say bye. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye, bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.